Okay, you could start. All right, I'm actually going to start lecturing too while you're doing the quiz. I hope you don't mind. Uh, okay, so today we're going to talk about quantum computation. <laughs> I'll start with a warning. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, if you, you can check the point values if you do mind. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk about quantum computation. This is not an idle picture, this is a real picture, by the way. Uh, I'll start with a warning. Uh, I do not know anything about physics at all, like seriously. But uh, luckily, you don't need to know anything about physics to do quantum computation. OK, so are we all like paying attention here? Thank you, yes. So let me tell you about a certain scientific theory. Uh, it hasn't been around that long, it's since about the late 60s. Uh, so it's too new for your parents to have learned about it in school, for example. Uh, it's a bit hard to do direct experiments to get evidence for this theory. In fact, you know, I was on Reddit the other day, for about like 44% of the day, and uh, I clicked on this one, what scientific fact do you think will be eventually proven false? And uh, it was the number one answer. In fact, the number one comment was by like a scientist in the actual field who wrote, you know, a lot of the theories seem a little tenuous to me. Yeah, so of course, as you might guess by now, I'm talking about plate tectonics. <laughs> you know, the theory that the continents like drift around and like make mountains when they crash together. That's kind of a sketchy theory. It has not been around that long. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, has been like standard part of physics for like 90 years. It's confirmed by like a zillion experiments. Like all your hard drives and GPSs are built in such a way to like correct for quantum mechanics. So don't even be skeptical, skeptical about quantum mechanics. Like it's legit. <coughs> okay, so uh, right. So the good thing about this lecture, even though I'm going to try to cram all of like quantum computation into 70 or 80 minutes, is that the first half will have nothing to do with quantum. So you'll like it. OK, so let me dial back the uh, time to the late 1930s when Boolean circuits were invented. Usually they're credited to Shannon, Claude Shannon, but they're actually basically simultaneously invented by Nakashima in Japan and Shestakov in Soviet Union. Uh, so this is like a Boolean circuit, right? Probably you've seen it before. Like there's like a gates and like not gates, and gates, or gates. OK, these are like input bits, and like they go through the circuit and like make an output bit. This little circuit I drew happens to compute the uh, XOR of X and Y. OK? Uh, actually, there's one thing I, you know, this is standard, there's one thing I don't like about this diagram is that like here these wires are like just splitting into two wires, which is a little weird. Uh, so I'm going to invent a new gate, which is slightly non-standard, called dupe, that like takes a bit and outputs, you know, two copies of that bit. Okay, so it's a basic fact that probably you all know is that if you have any like Boolean logic that you want to construct, any Boolean function, you can uh, make a circuit that computes it using like just AND, OR, and NOT gates, okay? And dupe gates if you also want to, you know, have this wire splitting thing. Okay, you've, you've probably seen that before. Um, and then it's also true that any function you can compute efficiently with like an algorithm in time t, you can like compile that algorithm into a circuit that has like poly and t gates. All right, another thing that you may probably know if you're into nerdy things like this is that, for example, you don't actually need the OR gates, okay? Because if you have an OR gate like this, you can convert it into like the negation of the AND of the negation of the bits, all right? That's the Morgan's law. And you can take it one step further. In fact, you don't even need sort of separate AND and NOT gates. You can do it all with just uh, this NAND gate. NAND is like you take the AND of two bits, and then you also negate it. So how do you do that? If you haven't seen it before, uh, well, one thing you also need to say is that you need um, scratch bits, extra bits. You'll see what I mean by that in a second. Um, OK, so to prove that, you know, we've got to get NOT and AND from NAND. It's sufficient to get NOT out of NAND, right? Because once you can do the NOT, if you want to do AND, just do NAND and then do a NOT. OK, so it's sufficient to get NOT. You should get a quiz, by the way, if you're coming in. Uh, <laughs> they're like here. Uh, OK, and so how do you do the NOT gate? It's, it's easy. It's like this. You put in x and you put in a 1. And you can see by the definition of NAND, that gives you NOT x out. 
And actually, this is what I mean by scratch input, this one here. It's like, you know, it's not really part of the input, but like it's just like some extra bits that you need to make the circuit work. Okay, but that's fine. Uh, there's actually another way you can do it with just no scratch bits, but I wanted to tell you what scratch bits are. Uh, okay. I'm also, for the purpose of this lecture, going to change this notation and write my bit one like this in this bizarre asymmetric brackets thing, which is like some weird notation invented by quantum me uh, mechanics people, but we're going to use it in this class. Okay, so this just means, you know, the bit one. <clears throat> okay, so uh, now flash forward, still no quantum, flash forward to the 1960s. We're going to talk about a topic called reversible computation. How are we doing on time? Oh, you still have a minute left. Okay, so. Uh, let's talk about bits for one second. Okay, so here, bits, in theory, they're just symbols, 0 and 1, right? Now, in practice, apparently, I told you, I don't know any physics, but like, maybe you make the wires with like some low voltage or high voltage or something, that's how you physically represent it. Or maybe you can use like photons to represent your bits if you're really doing nanotechnology, and so maybe horizontally polarized versus vertically polarized ones. But anyway, you have some sort of physical scheme for it in real life. And a gate is also like a physical gadget that like just manipulates a few physical bits, all right? So there's a theoretical version and a physics version. Okay. I think time is up. Can you pass your quizzes to the outside and the TAs can collect them? Dude, time is up. I gotta continue the lecture. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's bits in theory and in practice. Now let me ask you a question. Here's an AND gate. Okay. Suppose I tell you that the wire coming out has got like low voltage. Or whatever. Where you, this is like the best lecture. Seriously, unbelievable. Uh, okay. Suppose I tell you that it's a zero coming out. Okay then you cannot tell me what's coming in, right? There's more than one possibility. It could be like one zero, it could be zero one, it could be zero zero. Okay, so this is uh, not reversible, okay? Now, again, apparently this means, according to physics, that an, however you implement an AND gate, it must dissipate energy, okay? I don't actually know why, but apparently it's true <laughs> because it's not, it generates entropy, I don't know. But this is a fact, apparently. On the other hand, if you have a gate that's actually reversible, then for some physics reason, like, it's theoretically possible, in principle, that you can implement it such that energy does not dissipate. I don't know what those words mean, but apparently it's so, which is why this person, um, Landauer, thought about, like, hey, I wonder if we can, you know, make gates that are, like, reversible. And maybe that will help us get, like, low energy computing. Uh, so let's do a look at some examples. This is a NOT gate. It's reversible, right? If I tell you the output, you can tell me the input. Okay, this is the XOR gate. It's not reversible. Okay, if I tell you the output is one, you still don't, you know, you can't tell what the input was. Okay, this is a gate that will be important for us. It's called C naught, which stands for controlled knot. <laughs> what? What is that? <laughs> Seriously, C naught. Oh, oh. Well, I'm a theorist, you know. Uh, okay, C naught, yeah. So it, it works like this. Uh, it takes two inputs, has two outputs. The first input just goes through, and then the second one is this, X, X or Y. This actually is reversible. If you think about it, if I tell you the outputs, okay, if I tell you the top wire, then you know what the top input was. And then once you know the top wire, like, you can get the second input by, like, XORing the two outputs. Okay, so this is actually is a reversible gate. Uh, here's the dupe gate. This one's questionable because, you know, I haven't exactly defined reversibility. Actually, here, if I tell you the outputs, you can infer the input, surely. But I'm going to call this one not reversible because you should have the same number of input and output wires. Okay, I want it to be like a bijection between the inputs and the outputs. Anyway, let me just count that as not reversible. Uh, I want to show you one more gate. Uh, ooh, in a second. Uh, but, you know, now Landauer's question. Is it possible that you can compute every function with a circuit that only uses reversible gates? And the answer is yes, which is kind of cool. I'll show you in a second. 
Now there's, again, you need to allow some scratch bits. Just like when you, you know, convert things to NANDs, you need to allow yourself to put some ones in. And since you're going to have like the same number of inputs and outputs, some of the outputs you might not actually need. Those are called garbage bits. Okay, so you, I'm going to allow you to have some S scratch bits and G garbage outputs. Uh, so if you're computing an N bit function to an M bit function, you know, the input bits plus the scratch will equal the output bits plus the garbage. <coughs> okay, so how do you do this? It's quite easy. Here's another gate called CC not. Uh, invented by a guy called Toffoli, so also I might call it Toffoli gate. And it's similar to CC not. Uh, it takes three inputs, has three outputs. The X and Y just go through without change. And for the last bit, you flip Z if and only if X and Y are both one. Okay, so it's whatever, it's some gate. And if you think about it for two seconds, it's reversible. I mean, from the top two outputs, you infer the top two inputs, and then you can also figure out if the last bit was flipped or not, knowing X and Y. Okay, so that's some little gate, but as you're going to see, it's like a magical gate like NAND that can do everything, and it's reversible. So let's see an example or see something interesting. Say I take this CC not gate, I put X in, I put Y in, and I put a scratch bit of one in for the last one. So then, uh, what happens? I get, yeah? Uh, yeah, I mean, more succinctly, the X and the Y go through, and then, like, what happens here is that you take the AND of X and Y and negate it, so you get an AND of X, Y out. Okay, great. So you can use this guy to simulate a NAND gate. Uh, you might think we're done. Not quite done because uh, we use a scratch bit here. And actually, these guys are considered garbage bits if you're just trying to get a NAND, but that's okay. Uh, okay, here's one more thing you can do. You can put a 1, some X, and some 0 in. What happens here, the 1 goes out, the X goes out, and then x and 1 is the same as x, which you XOR with 0, so you get x out again. OK, so what you've accomplished here is the dupe. All right? You took x, and you got out two copies of x. OK, and again, there's two scratch bits and a garbage bit. OK, so that's it. So we got, we got this, with this one CC not gate, which is reversible. We can do NAND, and we can do dupe. So we can do any circuit we want you know, with just like a small blow up in size. Actually, I mean, if you're really picky, maybe you want all of your scratch bits to be one, just so you don't have to worry about it and just say the scratch bits are always one. But here we use the scratch bit of zero. But that's okay. If you want to get a zero when all your scratch bits are one, you can do this. Okay, so that's a minor point in case you care. Okay, so let's summarize. For any circuit F, let's say, let's say it takes N real inputs, and let's just say it has one output. You can do it for any number of outputs, but you can efficiently convert it into like a reversible circuit. OK, let me just explain this diagram here. Uh, there's like n true input bits, and then like there's a bunch of like scratch ones. And like they go along these wires, and then like this, let's say, oh, there's a mistake on this, this gate. OK, let's look at uh, this gate, this last gate. This means like you, this wire goes through, this wire goes through, and this wire is like the XOR of the incoming wire and the AND of these two wires. OK, so, uh, and then all the wires come out, and it's cooked up so that this is the answer, and these are just some garbage bits. OK, any questions about that? This is like, so I mean, this was figured out in the 70s or 60s, and um, yeah, I guess it, it turned out to be not that interesting for practice. I guess it's not that hard to make an energy efficient computer anyway, but it's like kind of a neat fact that we'll use later. OK, so let me continue going forward in time to the 70s. And the 70s where people had the idea of like, using randomness and probability when doing computations. So here are the early, some of the early pioneers in this area. Um, OK, so actually, this is the most important part of the lecture. Okay? I'm going to talk for a long time about just circuits and probability, which are two topics you've seen before. And then uh, quantum will just be like a little thing, well, somewhat little thing we add on at the end. So we're going to actually spend a lot of time talking about probabilistic circuits. OK, so let's say we start with a really tiny circuit with just one negation gate. And uh, 
Okay, but now let's say we flip a coin to like decide if the input will be zero or one. Okay, well, what happens? Well, uh, like in the random walk selection, I'm going to represent probability distributions by row vectors. Okay, so I'm going to write them like this. This means like a bit, 50% of the time it's zero and 50% of the time it's one. Okay, so now I pass it through this gate. What happens? Well, it switches whatever it was, but still the output has the property that 50% of the time it's zero and 50% of the time it's one. Okay, that was an easy example. Let's do a harder example. Here's the C naught gate. So I'm going to take just this gate and I'm going to flip a coin for the top uh, bits and the bottom bit I'm just going to make zero. So let's see what will happen. Actually, somebody tell me what will happen. What will the output look like? If you remember, this is C naught. I flip a coin for the top bit, and the bottom bit is always zero. Yes? And with 50%? The other 50%? Yeah. It's going to either be 0, 0, or 1, 1 with 50% each. So let's look at that. This is 50, 50. And so this bit across is going to be 50-50 as well. And actually, if you think about it, what happens here is you just take this bit, and it gets copied. So this bit will also be 50-50. OK, but this picture of what happens is very misleading. It's like not a good way to explain what's going on. OK, because as was said, actually, the two output bits will always be the same. So either they're going to be 0, 0, or 1, 1. So it's not like, you know, this bit is like 50-50 and independently this bit is 50-50, right? Okay, so this is not a good way to describe the output. To describe the output, you really need to say the probability of seeing each of the four possibilities, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Okay, so this is uh, how I would like to represent the output, okay? This is a, also a probability vector that's indexed by the four possibilities, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And, you know, if you think about it for two seconds, what you get here is that this is 0, 0 with half the chance and 1, 1 with half the chance. <clears throat> okay? Now, actually, as long as you're writing a vector for, like, both the wires simultaneously, you, should, you may as well do it for the input, too. Uh, so... You know, in this input picture, the second bit is always 0, and the first bit is 50-50. So you can write that also as a length 4 probability vector. 50% chance that it's, the inputs are 0, 0, a 50% chance that there's 1, 0, and 0 chance that there's 0 and 0, uh, uh, that the second bit is 1. <clears throat> okay, and we do this so that we can capture the correlations between the wires, okay? This is an important thing to understand. Any questions about this? Okay. Good. So actually, what's going on here is very much exactly like in the random walk lecture. Okay, you can think of the action of this gate as follows. You know, the incoming state of the two wires is one of four possibilities, and like there's some transformation that happens here that changes it to the same four possibilities, but with different probabilities. And you see, this is like the transition matrix, right? Like if the incoming wires are 0, 1, then with probability 0, you go to 0, 0. With probability 1, you go to 0, 1. 0, you go to 1, 0. And 0, you go to 1, 1. Okay, or if it's 1, 1, the output is always 1, 0. So, like, this is the transition. So, it's like one step in, like, a little Markov chain, I guess. So in fact, you can compute, if you know the input distribution of the, on the four possible inputs, you can compute the output distribution on the four possible outputs by just doing this vector matrix multiplication. <clears throat> Let me do a similar example. Here's this uh, CC naught gate. It has three wires coming in, which potentially could be sort of probabilistically correlated, and three coming out. So we can also represent it by a transition matrix. What size will that transition matrix be? Eight by eight. Because there's eight possible input states for the three wires and eight possible output states. 
And this is the matrix, and if you squint at it long enough, you see it works. Actually, for almost all input states, the three output wires are the same as the three input wires. So most of the time, this AND is false, but only if the first two bits are one do you sort of flop in the last output states. OK, now we're talking about probability. So here's like a one bit gate that I just made up. There's no special significance, but it's good for an example. So this is a gate I just made up. It takes in one input wire, outputs one input wire, and it does this. If it sees a zero coming in, then it does this Bernoulli 0.8. I will remind you what that means is it outputs one with probability 0.8 and zero with probability 0.2. On the other hand, if the wire coming in is a one, it does Bernoulli 0.1, which means it outputs one with probability 0.1 and zero with probability 0.9. So it's kind of like a noisy, like an approximate negation gate, right? Like if the zero's coming in, most of the time you output one. If a one's coming in, most of the time you output zero. Okay, but not quite, and it's actually a bit asymmetric. Zeros are more likely to get preserved, even though it's sort of like a not gate. <coughs> okay, there's nothing overly special about this gate, but it'll help me do some example. So the transition matrix for this gate is of what size? Two by two, yeah, because there's two incoming possibilities, zero and one, and two outgoing, zero and one. And here you see the input is zero. You do one with probability 0.8, zero with probability 0.2, and uh, this even more accurate knots if the one is coming in. OK. So in general, if you have a probabilistic gate, you can make it like a little physical device that also has some randomness in the gate. And if it, let's say it has k input wires and also k output wires, <coughs> then you can actually have any, you can implement any 2 by 2 to the k by 2 to the k matrix, which is a stochastic matrix. Okay, remember that means it's a matrix where all the rows add up to 1. And what it really means is it, it's a matrix that has the property that it preserves probability vectors. If you take a probability vector, meaning a vector that you know, adds up to one, and multiply it by this matrix, you'll get a probability vector out. Okay, and you can actually, for any such matrix, you could make a little gate that does that, assuming you had some physical way to generate randomness. OK, so you could just, I don't know, th this would be some other random two input, two output probabilistic gate. OK, here comes the trickiest part of the lecture. So if you didn't pay attention, start paying attention for a little bit. Uh, still has nothing to do with quantum. OK, we're going to spend a long time analyzing this circuit. It's a probabilistic circuit. It has two inputs and two outputs. OK, and it's actually not too hard to just like do it naively. Or I mean, I could have asked you about this circuit uh, in the probability homework. But we're going to do it in kind of a special way to like motivate the quantum version. OK, so it's a C0 gate on the two wires, then this weirdo gate, and then this weirdo approximate knot gate again. And let me say, uh, you know, our favorite thing to do is flip a coin for the first bit, and the second bit is just 0. <coughs> OK, so, you know, what happens is, like, time sort of goes by, or, like, the volts flow through the, I don't know if volts flow, but they go through the wires, through the gates. And what we want to figure out is like what's going on at the end. What's the probability of seeing each of the possible four outputs? OK, so we're going to sort of always going to be keeping track as time goes by of the probability distribution over both wires, or both bits. OK, so to start, you know, the second bit is always 0. And then the first bit is 50-50, so it's this vector. OK, then it goes through this gate. And we did this exact computation before. What happens when you put this through this gate, the C0 gate? This we saw was the transition matrix for this gate. And so you can get the distribution on the two wires here by doing this vector matrix multiplication. OK, if you want. I mean, you could just think about it. Like this bit goes through, and this one gets uh, XORed with this one. But you can do it formally this way. We did this already. So, so far at this point, you know, you're in this state that was kind of an interesting state where 
uh, either both bits are 0 or both bits are 1, and it's 50-50, which is which. OK. Next, you know, they go through, and this bottom bit gets fed into this weirdo noisy negation gate, okay, which has this transition matrix. So now you like, feel like you have a problem, right? Because there's something fishy. Like you cannot multiply this vector times this matrix. It's the dimensions are wrong. Okay? But like it's not like you know there's a flaw in mathematics or something, right? Like you can imagine what actually happens, right? I mean, this bit, what happens? This bit gets negated probably. In fact, you know, at this point you can see like you get into a state where like roughly half the time it's zero one and half the time it's one zero. But how can we get that mathematically? Okay, this is the most painful part, so let's think about it. Uh, so even though the gate in physical reality is only operating on this one whatever, photon, let's say, or magnet or whatever, uh, to, as a mathematician, to analyze what's going on and understand all the correlations, you have to expand this matrix into a, like a matrix that's like four by four that like acts on all of the possible four possible states. Okay, so this is the matrix. So why? So, okay, you have two bits coming in, and what happens? The first bit just passes through. There's like nothing here. And this one is like this approximate negation. So it makes sense, right? This is saying if the two bits coming in are 0, 0, you're either going to get 0, 0 or 0, 1 out. Because the first bit just stays, and like you're probably going to negate it. And if 0, 1's coming in, you get either 0, 0 or 0, 1 out, and it's probably 0, 0. You never have the second bit be 1, and, and so forth. OK, is this clear? Do you have a question about this? So it's just a thing you've got to do. Like, even though it, in actuality, it only touches this bit, you know, to analyze it, you need to have like, a matrix for the whole thing. <coughs> OK. So. Now we have a 4 by 4 matrix. We can like, you know, say if these are the probabilities coming in and this is the transition, then we can multiply them to get the probabilities coming out. Okay, so you do this multiplication and you get this. So it's like a sanity check. You see this is saying like 10% of the time you get 0, 0, 5% of the time you get 1, 1. That's not too probable. And like more probable is that you get 0, 1 or 1, 0, which is exactly what we said, right? We know here. It's half half whether it's 0, 0, or 1, 1, and like this approximately, probabilistically negates the second bit. So you're probably going to have either 0, 1, or 1, 0. And actually, zeros are a little bit more likely to stay put than ones, which is why this number is a little bit bigger than this number. <coughs> okay, this is, we got to get this. So, any questions about this? OK, so, well, let's do it all again. Uh, now the next thing that happens, we just figured out that this is the distribution here. The next thing that happens is we negate the top bit. Well, approximately negate it. We put it through this weird blue gate I made up. So this is the state here of the two wires. This is the transition matrix again for this little gate. But we're like, oh, yeah, like we have to expand this matrix so that it acts on all four states. OK? So let's expand it to this. Now you see, this is actually different than the matrix from last time, because the bits are in a different order. So let me show you again. What's happening here, we have two bits coming in. The first one gets sort of approximately flipped. The second one just stays put. So for example, if you come in with 1, 0, you're definitely going to end in a 0 state, either zero, zero, in the second bit, either 0, 0, or 1, 0. And probably you go to 0, 0, because probably you flip these bits. Okay. So if you come in with 0, 1, then the first bit stays, uh, wait, sorry, the second bit stays 1, and the first bit changes to 1 with probability 0.8 and stays 0 with probability 0.2. Okay, so it's a pain. I'll reflect on this pain as soon, but it's a pain. You, you make it into this thing so you can figure it out. Now you can do this as a transition matrix and multiply them. And you get this vector. And that's the state of the two bits 
at the end. So like, this is the final answer. Okay, and it's just one more sanity check. What's it saying? It's saying like 42.5% of the time you see 0, 0, 32% you see 1, 1, and like lesser percent that you see 0, 1, or 1, 0. Which again kind of makes sense, because we know at this point, you're 50, 50, 0, 0, or 1, 1, and then you kind of like approximately negate each bit. So, you know, most likely, again, you'll see 0, 0, or 1, 1. And again, zeros are actually slightly more likely to stay put. <clears throat> okay. So that's how we can analyze this and get from here to here. <clears throat> now, uh, that's if just, you know, somebody told you that, like, this is a physical experiment they were going to do. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the computation, you want to see what the answer is, right? So you're going to actually, like, look. You're going to put your voltmeter or whatever on this uh, wire and, like, see what bit it is. Okay? So that's called measuring. So the, you actually draw a gate for that that looks like this. All right? And so if I were to do that, uh, well, if I were to do that, what would I sort of see in this experiment? Can somebody tell me? Yes. Yeah, not even ish, but yeah, 55% for zero, because these are the two states where you have zero in the first bit. That adds up to 55%, and 45% uh, for the states beginning with one. Okay. And actually, this is a minor thing, but I'll say it. This is like if I gave you a conditional probability exercise and I asked you, okay, say you measure this and you see that it was zero. Then I said, what do you feel about what the other wire is? Well, actually, it's much more likely that the other wire is also zero than it's one. And in fact, the conditional probability of being in state zero, zero is 0.425 over 0.55. And the conditional probability of being in state zero, one is 0.125 over 0.55. And, you know, if you see a zero, you're never in state one, zero, or one, one. Okay, so a similar situation here. If you look at this bit and you see that it's actually a one. <clears throat> okay. Again, this is like uh, the most important part. You really need to have this understood because uh, we're almost there to quantum computation. <clears throat> Okay. Let me just make one final thought. Now, actually, this was a uh, circuit with like two bits and inputs and outputs. You're probably going to have like an actual, if you're in real life, like a circuit with like many n bits input and output. And if I make you like analyze, like, okay, if I give you these inputs, what is the output distribution? It's a big pain, right? Because you actually have to track, you know, these bits can get correlated with each other as they go through gates, and you have to keep track of all the joint correlations, which is really like a a probability vector of length 2 to the n, which is enormous. It's a big pain to analyze these mathematically. But it's actually just like a mathematical analysis thing that's like not a physical reality thing, right? Because in physical reality, it's not like nature like keeps track of these vectors, right? It's like each wire like actually has some bit, like the voltage on it, 0 or 1. And like maybe you're not looking at them in physical reality, so you just do this analysis, but when you actually do the experiment, like each wire is carrying an actual bit. <clears throat> okay, so nature doesn't remember all these vectors. We just remember them when we're doing the analysis. Okay, so finally, quantum computation. It's exactly the same as this probabilistic computation, exactly the same. There's only one twist, which is that the state vectors before were probability vectors, which meant their coordinates added up to 1. Quantum computation is the exact same thing, except the rule is that the sum of the squares of the coordinates add up to 1. That's the only difference, more or less. Now, I'll take like 20 slides to elaborate on what that means, but this is the summary. The same thing, only the sum of the squares of the coordinates add up to 1. Is that a question? OK. OK. So let's find out what this means. So this is quantum computation. It's sort of thought of in the 80s and 90s. Um, so let's return to our notion of a bit. Okay, so in theory, we're like, okay, it's, a, it's just a symbol, 0 or 1. In physics, in practice, maybe it's like a 
horizontally polarized photon or a vertically polarized photon if you're actually building some system. Now, here's the thing. I mean, apparently, according to the actual laws of physics that have been around for like almost a decade, uh, a photon state, polarization state, can actually be in any superposition of horizontal and vertical. Okay? which is denoted like this, alpha times zero plus beta times one, where alpha and beta are any complex numbers with the property that the sum of their squared magnitudes is one. Okay, complex numbers, you know, will even stress me out a little bit. So, in fact, you can essentially always pretend whenever you see a complex number, in, at least in 251, that it, it's only going to be a real number. Uh, we'll see a little bit more about that later, but... This is like the laws of physics. That's what it says. Like, uh, actually, a photon is always in a state that looks like this, whatever that means. I don't know, but that's what they say. Great. Um, so that's called a qubit, when you have like a superposition over two possible physical states called 0 and 1. <coughs> so uh, it looks, sometimes you write it like this. And these two coefficients are called the amplitudes. Uh, it's also sometimes, and I prefer to write it as a vector, just where it's like a two-dimensional vector. Looks a lot like these probability vectors where you have like alpha indexed by coordinate zero and beta indexed by coordinate one. Okay, and to say that the sum of the squares of the entries is one is like saying that the squared length of this vector is one, right? Because in like math, if you have a vector and you want to compute its length squared, you square all the entries and add them up. <coughs> okay, and as I said, as we're going to see in a second, it's, it's mostly not a problem if you just pretend these complex numbers are actually real numbers. In which case, it's just two real numbers whose sum of squares is one. Okay, so it's like a vector in two-dimensional space whose length is one, so it's somewhere on the circle. Okay, and like, this is like the zero axis or the horizontal axis, and this is the one axis or the vertical axis, and like in life, a photon will be in some state that's identified with a two-dimensional vector of length one. <coughs> uh, let me quickly remind you about complex numbers. I mostly put these so you could remind yourself on the slides later, but not that we're even really going to need it, but a complex number is like just a, a number of the form a plus b times i, where a and b are real numbers, and i is the square root of minus 1. Or you can just think of it as a symbol. It has a complex, okay, the complex numbers form a field. It has a complex, this number has a conjugate, which just means if it's a plus b i, then its conjugate is written with a star, and that's a minus b i. And if you take gamma and multiply it by gamma star, you get, after a little calculation, a squared plus b squared, and that's called the squared magnitude of gamma. Okay, but you can mostly think about real numbers. In that case, b is 0. So gamma is just a, and gamma star is just a, and the magnitude of gamma squared is just a squared. But this is in case you forgot about complex numbers. <coughs> okay, so let's go back to the qubit slide. Stands for quantum bit. Uh, okay, so this is what a qubit is, and we can write it in one of two ways, either as a vector whose length is 1, length squared is 1, same difference, or write it like this. And just one thing I want to say is, it's not like some kind of probabilistic mixture of 0 and 1, like somehow there's like an alpha probability that doesn't even make sense of being horizontal and a beta probability of being 1, like, it just is what it is, like that's the law of nature. A photon state is defined by these two numbers. Okay, that's if you have one qubit. Now, what happens if you have two qubits? Like, if you have two photons, and you're like, let's bring them together. Uh, so, in fact, let's imagine you have that. Like, maybe some person has a photon, and it's in this state, alpha, beta. <coughs> and then a friend comes along and also has a photon in their pocket in the state, alpha, prime, beta, prime, and you just put them next to each other. It's kind of like, in probability, if you have, like, two random bits, but, like, you prepared them independently. You just, like, brought them together. Well, eventually, we're going to start plugging them into quantum circuits. So just like in the probabilistic case, we're going to need, looks good, we're going to need to uh, understand their sort of joint distribution. Okay? And the rule for that is just like in the probability case, you like 
you know, like multiply them. So I told you they're not probabilities, but for the purposes of figuring out what the joint state is, which is going to be a length 4 vector when there's two qubits, you do what you think. Like for 0, 0, it's alpha times alpha prime, and for 1, 0, it's, you know, alpha. Oh, I screwed this up. Great. All right, I'll fix the slides. For 1, 0, it should be beta alpha prime. I wrote it wrong. That's a shame. Uh, anyway, I got 1, 1, right? It's beta, beta prime. Okay, and, you know, I kind of told you that quantum states should have the property that the sum of the squares of the amplitudes is 1. You can actually check that that's okay. Because if you take the sum of the squares of these four numbers, you get this, and you can factorize it like this. Oh, I did it wrong again. Sorry. It's filled with typos. This should say alpha uh, squared beta squared. This should say alpha prime squared beta prime squared. If I'd done it right, then, you know, these guys' sum of squares is 1, and these guys' sum of squares is 1, so you get 1. Okay, so don't look at the slide, because it's all messed up, but I'll fix it when I put, uh, post it. Any questions about what it's supposed to say? This is alpha, alpha prime. This should be uh, alpha, wait a minute, alpha, beta prime? That's right. This one should be beta... Alpha prime, okay. Oh, it is right, I just, okay, maybe it's right. I just, I forgot that multiplication commutes. <laughs> this one's wrong, though. All right, I'll fix it. This should say alpha plus beta prime. I mean, this is actually correct, but, okay, anyway. <laughs> All right. Now, that's what happens if you just take two photons and, like, prepare them separately and then, like, just have them stand next to each other. But actually, in general, if you have two photons in real life, they can actually be, I mean, by the law of nature, they can actually be in any superposition that looks like this, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, where these are four complex numbers whose squares add up to one. Okay, so that's just the rules. If you have two photons, they can be anything like this. And we also, again, write this as like a vector often, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And again, this, you know, this rule says that the length of this vector squared, if you want, is 1. So this is a famous example of a, such a state. I wrote it in this way. So it's got 1 over root 2 amplitude on 0, 0, 1 over root 2 amplitude on 1, 1. Uh, it's also, you could write it like this. This is called EPR pair. It stands for Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen because they got kind of freaked out by this possibility. Uh, and here's a fact. This is not of this form. There's no alphas and betas and alpha primes and beta primes such that if you do this, you get this. Okay? This is a legal state for two photons, but it's not a state that's formed just by like, taking two any old photons that are unrelated and standing them next to each other. Okay? So this is called an entangled state. These two photons are somehow entangled together, and their state is like a real joint state. Okay, so actually most vectors you write, almost any vector you write here will be entangled. It's only like a very rare case that it looks like this. <clears throat> okay, any questions? <clears throat> okay. So what if you have n qubits? If you have like a bunch of qubits, then in general, they can also be entangled, and in general, it's like the definition of what their state is, is like a vector of length 2 to the n. Any vector of length 2 to the n, where the sum of the squares, or sum of the squared magnitudes, is 1. Okay, and we normally index the coordinates by length n strings, okay? Like we've been doing in the case of 1 and 2. So like the coordinate would be like v sub x, where x is an n-bit string. Okay, just a giant vector, the sum of squares of entries is 1. Question? Okay. Okay, so now I told you what states, like, qubits can be in. So now we come to the actual computation part, which, again, is going to be like, we're going to take them and, like, put them through some gates and see what happens. So let me tell you about quantum gates. So let me try to imagine a quantum gate, and then I'll tell you the actual rules for quantum gates. 
Let's sort of imagine we have a quantum gate that has two inputs and two outputs. So you bring two photons somewhere, you do something to them, and you take them out. <clears throat> so the state coming in here is going to be some superposition over the four possibilities. And a gate will, again, just as in the probabilistic case, be represented by some 4 by 4 matrix that tells you how to go from the input to the output. So let's call that u for now. And it's, you know, it's indexed by, rows and columns are indexed by the two-bit vectors. And what property does u have to have? You see, we want it to be the case, at least, that the, the, the state that comes out is like this vector times u. On the other hand, I told you that like all states have to be you know, vectors. This will be a length 4 vector whose sum of squares of entries is 1. Uh, something like that. It's almost something like u squared has to be 1. So uh, that's a good point. Um, what it can be is any u, in fact, you can have any u with the property that it sort of preserves the property of having length 1. You can have any vector u with the property that whenever you multiply a, a, a length 1 vector against it, you get a length 1 vector. That at least is at least potentially OK for you know, preserving quantum states. And in fact, that's what is the situation in physical reality. Like any vector u that has this property, you can build a little device that will implement that on two, let's say, photons. <coughs> I'll come back to that in a second. But let's think about this condition again. What are these matrices u? Maybe you saw it if you've done linear algebra. They're, called unitary matrices. They're matrices that have the property that if you think of them as a map on vectors, they don't change the length of the vector. They're kind of like rotations, or rotations and reflections. So it's called unitary. Uh, I'll give you some examples in a second, but here's a, a basic fact from linear algebra, which is more or less what you said. Um, an equivalent condition is this. Which may or you may or may not be able to decipher these symbols. I'll, if you haven't seen before them, I'll tell you what they mean. Well, it's not too important to get it. Uh, this i represents the identity matrix. It's the matrix with all ones on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. And this u dagger means the conjugate transpose of u, which means you take u, you like flip it across the diagonal, and you take complex conjugates of all the entries. It's not super important that you remember that, but you can look at this later. Anyway, it, it's some. This is hard to check, right? How can you check that a matrix preserves all vectors? But this is easy to check. You just have to take the matrix, flip it, star all the entries, multiply it with the original matrix, and see if you get like all ones, 0, 0. In a second, I'll let you forget about this. But uh, This is actually equivalent to saying that the inverse of the matrix U, if you know what that is, is the conjugate transpose, which in particular means that the matrix is invertible or reversible. Okay, so I only say this to say that any U that has this property also has the property that's invertible or reversible, which is why we talked about reversibility at the beginning. Any operation you can do to qubits has to be a reversible operation. Uh, any question about this? I'm going to give you some examples of such a U. Yeah, yeah, the elements can be complex numbers. No, don't think, yeah, it's tough. You, we're going to be inspired by the probabilistic computation, but they're not probabilities. For the u's, they're just, I don't know, numbers. Sometimes you're doing physics, you're like, I don't know what this means. It's just some math that you do that's correct. It like, accurately models reality. So that's what's happening here. Like, weirdly, the thing that accurately models the reality of like how you can manipulate a couple of photons involves like matrices of complex numbers. Somewhat too bad, but that's life. OK, but let me give you some examples. So this is the negation gate. And this is actually a perfectly fine quantum gate. OK, this, the matrix for this looks like this. And it's not hard to check that, for example, this matrix times its conjugate transpose, which is the same as its transpose, gives you identity. Another way to see it, though, is this matrix has the property that if the state coming in is alpha beta, you multiply it against this, the state going out is beta alpha, like switches them. 
Okay, and you can now see, like, if this guy has the property that the sum of the squares of the entries is one, then this guy, you just shuffled the entries. So its sum of the squares of its entries is also one. So that's a way you can tell that this is like a legal unitary matrix or a legal quantum gate. You can also just take my word for it that you're allowed to do this. Okay, another valid quantum gate is the C naught gate that we saw before. So this was its matrix. Again, you can quite easily check that it times its transpose is the identity matrix. Or as before, you see here if the incoming state looks like this, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, then the outgoing state, once you do this times this, is alpha, beta, delta, gamma. So if these guys square and sum up to one, so do these guys. Same with the CC naught gate. It also has the property that just shuffles around the amplitudes like this. So far, we haven't done anything like new that like involves complex numbers or even negative numbers. But like now, I will show you the one like truly important quantum gate that is not corresponding to anything in the classical world. It's called Hadamard gate, and it only operates on one qubit. Okay, so it's a two by two matrix, and it's this one: one over root two, one over root two, one over root two minus one over root two. Okay, you can check if you want that this is really a unitary matrix. It preserves lengths uh, by, let's say, multiplying this guy by its transpose, which is also itself. You get one zero zero one. But otherwise, just take my word for it. This is a legal gate. And what's its action? If the bit coming in is in state like alpha beta, then the bit coming out is in this state. You know, it combines the amplitudes in this rule. That's this vector times this matrix. Okay, so then you might be saying, like, what does this even mean? Yeah, we'll see eventually, but this is like some physical way you can manipulate like a qubit or a photon with these amplitudes and change it to have these amplitudes for what it's worth. Any questions about that? This is a bit hard to see where this is going, but we're now going to like show what happens if you put them together and you can manipulate like bunches of photons in like really weird ways now that you have like negative entries and you can get some crazy correlations or entanglements between them. <clears throat> so for example, this is a very simple quantum gate. I'll give you a more extensive example at some point. Uh, if you have zero coming in, you sort of just saw if you put it through this gate, you'll get into this state, this state with amplitudes one over root two and one over root two. Then you can feed it in again. You like multiply this as a vector against this, and actually you get just this state back. Okay, so that's just the rules of matrix vector multiplication. Okay, so these are all examples of, of quantum gates. These three gates that are familiar from the classical world, plus the Hadamard gate. And I, I just want to emphasize that these gates are all physically realizable, like. Apparently, with like lasers, you take the photons and like to do this gate, you like fire lasers at them in some way, and it, it changes them according to the rules that I said. It, it's no joke; like they can actually do this. <clears throat> okay, so it's just like now you can imagine like doing you know playing around with these photons, just like they did with like electrical circuits back in the 40s or whatever. Okay, so I showed you some unitary matrices, actually. There's infinitely many, but just like in the case for classical circuits, you don't really need like every possible gate, okay? You can actually get, do anything you want with just a few gates. Like with classical computation, you just needed two, this duplication gate and the NAND gate. There's a similar fact for quantum circuits. It's quite nice. It just says, without loss of generality, the only gates you really need are Hadamard and this CC naught. And that's all you need to know. And actually, that's nice. Uh, this was proven by Yao Yunshi, not uh, like 2001 or something. Uh, and this is actually pretty, it's, okay. It's also convenient, by the way, although you only really need these. Most of the time, I'm also going to throw in C0 because it's like it's annoying to always use NAND, right? Sometimes you're like, just give me an AND gate. Okay, so similarly, we're going to sometimes also throw in C0. Well, what's good about this is if you remember these three gates, they actually only had real numbers in their matrix. So that's why you can basically, without loss of generality, only worry about real numbers. <clears throat> okay, so now 
Uh, I'm going to spend like the next 10 minutes like on a, like a long example, just like in the probabilistic, you know, the painful probabilistic circuit case. I'm going to do a, another such example with the quantum circuit. You'll see it's quite similar. So this is the circuit I want to play with for a while. It's two inputs and two outputs. First you do the Hadamard gate on the top qubit, and then you do the C naught gate. Furthermore, I'm going to assume that like the incoming qubits are just zero and zero. Like you, two people make like horizontally polarized photons and bring them to this gate. Okay. Um, okay. So initially, the qubits start out separated. So although in full generality you should really write the joint state for these two guys, it's okay to just apply the Hadamard to this guy first and then really get started here. Okay? You can imagine that like Alice has this qubit zero on the moon, and she like Bob is on Earth, and she does the Hadamard gate by herself to it. And then only when it gets to here do they actually get together and put it through this second gate. Okay, so this is the transition matrix for Hadamard. Or the gate matrix for Hadamard. And as we saw before, you know, if the state starts out sort of a hundred percent no percent is not good, but all in zero, which is the vector one comma zero, you multiply it by Hadamard and you get the first column, which is half, or sorry, one over root two, one over root two. Okay, so we did that on a previous slide. So like as time goes by, this photon goes from this state, purely in state zero, to like this superposition. Okay, and here nothing has happened to this qubit, so it's still in the state sort of all on zero, one zero. Okay, so now just like in the probabilistic case, we have two qubits that are about to jointly go into a gate. So we kind of have to like get their joint state so we can hit them with the matrix. Okay, so as I said, just like as though it were, this is not a good slide, as though there were probabilities to get their joint state, you know, the, the joint amplitude of zero, zero is just this product of these two, it's one over root two. The joint amplitude of 0, 1 is the product of these guys, which is 0. For 1, 0, it's 1 over root 2. And for 1, 1, the joint amplitude is 0. OK, so this is like the state of the two qubits going into this gate. OK, any questions? All right, so this is the matrix for a C naught gate. So the next step is easy. You just multiply this times this. And you get this vector. And that's actually a bit interesting. This is the 1 over root 2 amplitude on 0, 0, and 1 over root 2 amplitude on 1, 1, which is this state. It's another way of writing it. And this is that EPR state I mentioned before that's entangled. OK, so if you're wondering how do you get entangled bits, you do this. I mean, you take two bits that are 0. You stick them through this circuit, and that entangles them so that they're in this state that's sort of like 1 over root 2 on 0, 0, and 1 over root 2 on 1, 1. OK, and now, like, for now on, you have to remember that these guys are entangled. OK, so uh, that's the situation. In some sense, you know, you could be like, all right, I'm done. Like, I finally figured out if they start in this state, the qubits end in this state. But again, if you're computing, right, you're like, okay, what is the answer? Like, what did this compute? Okay, and so as before, you might say, okay, now I will like actually look at these photons and see how they look. Okay, to measure them. And this is where there's a bit of a twist, I mean, that compared to probabilistic computation. This is again a fact about physics. In the real world, if you actually look at a photon, however that's done, you will only ever observe it to be horizontal or vertical. You will not observe it to be in like one of these superposition states. <clears throat> Even though like, you know, these two qubits are like in a weird superposition state. So somehow the explanation is that like when you look at a photon, like it snaps into some state, like a pure state, either horizontal or vertical. Even though like its internal state initially was some superposition. Again, that's just the way the world works. And, you know, I'll just tell you, I'll give you the rule in a second, but you might guess what happens here. If their state of these two bits is like this, 
there's two, four things you might see. 0, 0, or horizontal, horizontal, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. And you might guess correctly that in this case, you'll see 0, 0 with probably a half. You'll see 1, 1 with probably a half. And zeros, uh, you won't see these states ever on these two wires. So it's weird. Even though they're in this state, then when you look at them, they jump to either 0, 0, or 1, 1. Okay, and the prob probability of them jumping to a certain state is like the square of the amplitude. That's, again, just the rule of physics. Okay, so I'll give you a slide about quantum measurement. Uh, okay, so let's do it simple. Let's say you have one photon, in, and it's sitting there in nature in its state. You haven't, like, looked at it yet, but it's in some superposition. Alpha and beta are the amplitudes. And then you're like, okay, now I look at it. It's kind of actually like in probability, probabilistic computation, right? Where like, you imagine somebody has done the experiment, but you haven't looked at it yet. And then you sort of look to see, oh, how did that wire actually come out? OK, so what happens when you do this in life? You're going to see 0, or horizontal polarization, with probability you know, magnitude of alpha squared, and 1 with probability magnitude of beta squared. It's just the rule of what happens. And that is, I mean, mathematically sensible, right? Because by definition, we know that the squares of these two numbers add up to 1. So this is valid. Like, this is a non-negative number, this is a non-negative number, and they add to 1. So it's really possible that this happens, and indeed it does happen. <clears throat> and furthermore, once you, like, look at this, this photon or whatever, like, and you observe it in a state, like, then it stays stuck in that state. So you can say that the state, in this case, collapses to being like all of its amplitude on horizontal, or 0. And in this case, it collapses to all of its amplitude on 1. <clears throat> OK. Uh, so a th similar thing happens if you have two qubits. Somehow they get entangled, and they're in this state, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And then you like look at them, and you see 0, 0 is probably alpha squared, 0, 1 is probably beta squared, et cetera. Okay, and again, by definition, these are non-negative numbers adding up to 1. OK, and the state like, collapses. Like, once you look at it, and maybe with probability beta squared, you see this, like, then it goes to that state. OK, and similarly for measuring 3-bit states or n-bit states, if you have n entangled particles, the state is a length 2 to the n vector of complex numbers, the sum of whose magnitude squared is 1. And they're just sitting there in their state. But then if you look at them, like it changes to one of the actual 2 to the n states with probability equal to the amplitude squared. <coughs> OK, and in general, like, a big quantum circuit looks like this. OK, this is the schematic for a big quantum circuit. It's similar. You see, you know, I drew it. You only need uh, Hadamard gates and these CC not gates, or here by mistake is a C not gate, but that's actually OK, too. And you have n input states, which is like your real input to the problem. And those are like not entangled states. Like, if you want x1 to be 1 and x2 to be 0, you just make x1 vertical. And over here, you make x2 horizontal, and then you just put them together into these wires. OK, and this like does Hadamard to the first one, and then Hadamard to this one. These are scratch inputs. And then you do all these gates. Time goes like this. And at the end, they're in some like giant length, more than 2 to the n, actually, because they're scratch bits, some giant state. And then you actually, OK, all the while in your apparatus, you make sure not to look at it. And then you look at it at the end. And measure all the states, and it collapses to some, you know, answer of length n plus s here. Okay, and you know maybe if you're just computing one bit, you know the first bit is on the first, the, the desired output is on the first photon, and then the rest are just garbage. You don't care what they are. Yeah. That's a good point. So. Uh, you see, uh, the question was like, when you do this measurement, right, there's some probabilistic thing that happens. 
Uh, so yeah, you'll see, if you were to do it like a bunch of times, you'll see like different outputs with some probability, okay? So what you need to do as like the mathematical or computer science designer of this circuit, you need to like cook it up in such a way such that no matter what the input is, this output state has almost all of its amplitude uh, on sort of the first uh, coordinate. This, okay. It, you need to cook it up such that you're sure, like mathematically, that like almost all of the probability, uh, almost all the outcomes have the right answer in f of x. It's possible if you're smart, you can do that. Um, in fact, sometimes you can even arrange so that like with probability 100%, it gives you the correct answer by just like some weird, amazing, you know, calculations and like amplitude shifts and so forth. You'll get the exact right answer. Maybe other times you'll like be able to cook up a circuit so that it'll give you the right answer with probability like 80%. And then you can, if that's also pretty good, because then you can take your apparatus and like do it a thousand times, and like 80% of the time you'll get the right answer, and you'll figure out what the right answer is. But yeah, if you're not careful, then I mean, you'll probably just get like totally random bits that have nothing to do with what you want. Yeah? No, it's not that, okay, so what is the point of all this? I'll get to that in a second. It's not that it uses less energy, it's that somehow, these gates have some amazing properties that by virtue of like having like negative numbers in them, you can like, I don't know, it's weird, but like cancel amplitudes like really in strange ways such that you can build a very small circuit that com actually computes, let's say with high probability, like a function that might take you a lot of normal gates to build. So, uh, you know, this lecture is only 80 minutes long, so I can't give you too many examples. If you'll see an example or two on homework. But I'll also talk about it a little bit at the end. Actually, there's not really any more technical slides, so the rest is sort of philosophy. <coughs> uh, oh, I guess there are a couple more technical slides. Uh, so let's go back to this example quantum circuit. We've designed this weirdo circuit such that if you put in 0, 0, at this point you'll get two bits that are in this entangled state. Okay, and now imagine I throw it, I mean, imagine I'd thrown an extra Hadamard gate down here on the second bit, qubit. Okay, so we know this is the matrix for Hadamard. And just like before, right, you know, this is two by two, and this is length four. You can't do it, but as before, you need to, like, expand this matrix so that it will act on all four state amplitudes. This is just like in the probabilistic case. So what you need to do is expand it, and it's just according to the same rule as in the probabilistic case. So you kind of imagine, okay, suppose 0, 0 in a pure state was coming in, the top bit doesn't change. There's nothing up here. Or the bottom bit goes to like a superposition of 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2 on 0 and 1. So this is like the top bit is always 0, the top bit is always 0 here, but the first bit goes to this row, okay, and so forth. So it's the same rule. You can take a look at the slide. Um, you have to expand it so that it acts on both bits. Okay, and now we can apply the vector matrix multiplication, and you get this state. Okay, there's no punchline here. I mean, this is just how it works. You get into this state, these two wires, or photons are in this state. So, for example, if you were to measure the two wires at this point, if you were to actually look at the wires, you'd see each of the four possibilities <laughs> with probability a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, and negative a half squared is also a quarter. You actually see two, like, totally random bits. Okay, so this is actually how you could analyze what happens with an entire quantum circuit. And now, I mean, I'll slowly get to this question about what's the point, but let me just actually make an observation here. Uh, you see, here we had two photons that were in some entangled state, and then we applied the Hadamard gate to the second one. And this is like a physical operation. You fire some lasers at the, like, the second photon, and it goes from this state to that state, the two photons. In fact, you can actually imagine that like, at this point, they got to this point, they have an entangled two photons. Alice takes the first photon, Bob takes the second photon, and they fly like light years apart from each other. 
And then, then Bob applies his gates, his like laser or whatever, to his photon that he has. And that changes the overall state of both the photons to this. Okay? So Bob did this thing light years away from Alex to his photon, Alice. And nevertheless, Alice's, I mean, the state that includes Alice's qubit changes. Uh, which is a bit weird. Sometimes it's called spooky action at a distance. It's not really that weird, though. Well, OK, actually, it is kind of weird, <laughs> as you'll see uh, actually on your homework. But it's not weird, actually, until you think about it for a long time, because there's a similar thing that could sort of happen in the probabilistic world, which is not that weird, right? Alice and Bob could get together, and they could like tape two coins together so that they're the same orientation, and they could like flip them without looking. So now they're either both heads or both tails. Still without looking, they can like rip off the tape. Bob can take one, Alice can take one, and they like fly away, and they both have their coins like this. So it's, it's still true, right, that like, if Bob like looks at his coin and sees heads, then he knows Alice has heads. Or if Bob like flips his coin without looking at it, and then he looks at it and he sees heads, then he knows Alice has tails. Okay, and in fact, if you want to like do all these experiments with like little circuits, you could, and it'll still have the property that like, you know, if Alice and Bob's coins are in some probabilistic distribution, and like Bob does the action of flipping his coin, that actually overall changes the joint state. So if you think about that, then maybe you're like, well, maybe it's not so weird, but actually some weirder things can happen, as I think you'll see on homework. But anyway, that's also a fact of life that, for example, made Einstein very mad, but that's how the world works. And you can actually, I mean, you can actually do this with like a physical experiment. They've done it. It's, that's how it works. So here's the last technical thing I'll say in some sense. Just as before, when we were talking about probabilistic circuits, right? If you have an n-bit quantum circuit, and I'm like, analyze it. Like, if these are the input states, like, what is the output state of the n photons or whatever? It's very annoying and hard, because they can get correlated as you put them through gates. And like, as it goes on, you have to like, keep track of these vectors of length 2 to the n, of complex numbers even. Unlike in the probabilistic case, though, uh, in physical reality, like, nature actually does this. Like, unlike in the probabilistic circuits, it's not like the qubits are secretly in some definitive state, and like, you just don't know what it is. They're not like definitely horizontal or vertical, and you just haven't looked at them yet. They're really actually in these like weird states that are like giant correlated uh, superposition states. Like even if you take them in superposition and move them far apart, like they still all remember that they're entangled, according to some like giant vector. So that's weird, that's strange but true. And experiments confirm that this is how the universe actually works. So actually, though, I mean, the idea is we'll see, one idea is we'll see in a second that Feynman had is, OK, the universe is like doing all this like amazing computational work somehow. So let's harness that to our advantage. OK, so now let's answer this question. Why should we study quantum computers? Particularly because, you know, after like whatever, 80 minutes, I didn't show you a quantum computer doing anything like that remarkable, or a quantum circuit. One reason is like, why not? Like, these are the laws of physics. Physics allows us to do this. So like, why not just see what we can do? Um, this idea that Feynman had back in the 80s that some of the sense started quantum computation was like, Suppose you're, like, suppose you're an actual physicist, and like, you want to like, simulate a quantum system with like, 50 qubits and find out how it operates. If you want to you know, use your computer to assist you in simulating that, it's impossible. Like, you can't do it, because you need to have these vectors of length 2 to the 50, which you cannot store, right? Or there's 100, 2 to the 100. <coughs> so that's crazy. But then he's like, well, one way you could simulate it is just like, actually get those 50 bits and just like, let them do their thing. And you could just define that to be your computer. And it's like some physical device that's computing the right answer at the end. So just if you redefine like, these physical things to be like a computer, then what's going on is it's doing a simulation efficiently that we don't know how to do efficiently with classical computers. We can do it non-efficiently. I mean, if we could imagine somehow like 
compute with all these length 2 to the 50 vectors. It's not like it's impossible, but it's just super, seemingly super inefficient. But in physical reality, you can, you can do it. So, you know, for a while, people were like, well, that's cool. Like, I guess if you invent the notion of a quantum computer or a quantum circuit, you could use it to simulate quantum circuits. That's a little tautological, I guess. But as it turns out, there, this is where it gets really interesting. There's other problems, computational problems, that can be solved efficiently with quantum circuits, even though we don't know how to do them with normal classical circuits or probabilistic circuits with less than exponential complexity. So that's sort of what makes it cool. Let me give you an example. So Shor's algorithm. So here is Peter Shor. Uh, and in 1994, he's like, check it out. Here's a, a quantum circuit with n cubed gates that can compute the factorization of an n-bit number. And this is something that we really do not know how to do in, in normal computers, right? To factor an n-bit number, it seems like it takes exponential complexity. I mean, uh, the fastest algorithms we know are like exponential complexity. And like, this is the basis of our crypto systems, like RSA, the fact that like it's hard for like an attacker to factor your RSA keys. But you can do it efficiently with a quantum circuit and you know, thereby crack RSA. Okay, so at that point, a lot of people were like, hey, this is quantum computation, like, let's figure this out. It sounds good. Uh, so now that was 20 years ago. And you may be saying, like, all right, lots of people, like, where's the quantum computers? Why haven't you got them for me? Well, they're working on it, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's a really hard engineering problem. It's, you know, it's like you're saying, like, okay, Newton, like, you got F equals MA, how come we're not flying to Mars yet? Like, take some time. Uh, so in 2012, they, like, <laughs> did sure, and they factored 21, okay? Beating the previous record of 15. This is, a, this is an actual photo of the apparatus from the lab. Yeah, they did it, and it was like, it's three times seven. <laughs> They're like, good for you, Quanti. Okay, so maybe in next year when I teach this lecture, it'll be up to, wow, 35, dare I say it? I don't know. Okay, so, yeah, so now, I mean, I started with circuits in the 1930s, but you can even go all the way back to the 1840s. In the 1840s, there was a gentleman called Babbage, and he was like, hey, I have this great idea for something I call analytical engine. It's basically a universal computing device. And he's like, it totally works great, in theory. We just have to build it. Uh, and he's like, you're going to need a lot of punch cards to operate it. And actually, the, you know, the UK government gave them like a lot of money to try and build it, and they were not successful. Flash forward, oh, sorry, not don't flash forward yet, because also at the same time, there was this person, Ada Lovelace, who's like, hey, that's a cool idea, Babbage, and I'll, I'll actually write some code for your machine to like, I don't know, compute the Bernoulli numbers, whatever those are. She's like, you know, this is going to be awesome as soon as it gets built. Like, I've got the code for it right here. We just need to build it. Yeah, so flash forward 100 years, and they built it. Okay, this is like ENIAC or whatever in uh, 1945. This is like the first like, physical device that actually was a universal computer. Okay, so it only took them like 100 years. That's maybe the status we're in. So the moral of the story is, you know, be patient. Uh, by the way, you know, we have quantum computers in theory, right? So we can at least work on the software. Now, actually, in some sense, this is not a completely fair statement, but if you're being a little bit mean, you can say that basically Shor's algorithm is the only one we know that's like an interesting, cool thing quantum computers can do that classical computers cannot, as far as we know. But there could be like many more awesome things. I mean, it blew up people's minds when he showed that you could factor efficiently. So uh, that's what you should do. In the meantime, please be like a Lovelace and figure out some uh, quantum circuits. So um, see you on Thursday. <laughs>